in your church. My name is Dave Warner. I'm a pastor. Um, I, and it's, it's tempting to say, like, here? Pastor here? Like, it's a location? Uh, we don't have much of a location, really, right now. We're kind of in flux because we're mostly online, which is, which is okay. So, those of you tuning in, God bless you. Thank you for joining us. A couple of announcements we want to share with you before we start. Uh, tonight is Unite, our... our um, student uh, countywide thing that we have going uh, and you are welcome to come live is that right uh, so those who are with engage York come live otherwise tune in on Facebook um, as it starts at 7 what time do they need to come if they're going to show up though 6 30 at, at more live church we're not doing it here we're not hosting it so we're we're over at more live from there so all right um, brief share. Did you guys want to say a few things about it? Come on up. Uh, tell us something about. This is uh, Shauna and Vicky. Uh, they are leading Grief Share uh, together. So you guys are right there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Grief Share is um, for those who have lost a loved one, or if you know of anybody who's lost a loved one. How many people know of somebody or have lost a loved one, or know of somebody who have? Okay, so that really affects you, um, and um, it can go on for a very long time or a short time because grief for everybody is different. Um, it's a 13-week course. Um, we're meeting on Monday nights from 6.30 to 8.30 in the um, um, Little Arrows. Um, anybody can come. They can join at any session or come to the whole, whole session, um, and it's three parts. We do one that part that's... Um, we do give them home, give everybody homework, and then they come back and we discuss the homework, and that's their part between them and God. And then the second part is a video, um, which we watch together, and then we discuss that. And then there's other people in the group so they can share experiences. And um, just a wonderful healing time, and to um, hear that whatever person is going through is normal. There's nothing that, you know, people say, well, you should be over that by now, or you shouldn't be doing that. No, there's nothing that isn't normal um, and just really healing. So if you know anybody who would benefit from that class, we do limit it to eight people so that, um, and we have five now. So we do limit it so people have opportunity to share. You have a theme on that? Okay. okay. So Thank sign you. up online, uh, griefshare.org, I think. Griefshare. I don't have another. You can Google griefshare and they'll take you there. Tom grief.org okay griefshare.org and then you can just like 43055 it'll take you right to ours and you can register that way all right a couple of announcements uh we're going to do water baptisms on two sundays from now on sunday september 13th after worship we're going to go over to joe Carmen's house and dip you in the pool if you want to get wet uh, uh we will baptize you in the name of jesus christ and uh, so let us know if you want that. We've got one guy for sure um, from Daniel who's going to do that. And uh, so if anybody else wants to get baptized, please let me know. And then um, if God's leading you to participate in worship through giving, you can do that online, engagenewark.com slash give. Or those of you who are here in person, there's a little basket there by the door. Also, I sent this out for those who are uh, able to, to receive our text messages our sister church in Haiti that uh, we've, we've attempted mission trips there before, um, they have a number of churches throughout Haiti. I think they've got 15 or 20 churches that they also work through. One of their churches uh, in a little village, um, they, they're having food supply issues, supply chain stuff, especially during COVID-19. They've always had a little bit, a bit of trouble, but now it's even worse. Uh, so they've requested some money so they can buy food in Port-au-Prince and take it there. Uh, for uh, $25, we can send uh, 40 pounds of rice. So our leadership team actually uh, 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 voted to redirect some of our COVID-19 relief fund help that we have here for Licking County to take $300 of that and apply it in Haiti. And then on top of that, uh, they've actually uh, matched it with 300 of their own. And so we're looking for anybody else, if you want to participate in that way, to, to add to that. We will send that money tomorrow. So today's the last day. You can go to engagenorth.com slash give. And then on the drop down box, just hit Haiti. And uh, so we'll collect that. We'll see what we've got there through the end of today. And then tomorrow we'll make that send uh, with Western Union. So uh, I think that's all the announcements we have. Let's 
take a moment to pray, and uh, then we'll continue in worship through singing. God, uh, I thank you again uh, for gathering us here. Um, and, and this just weighed heavy on me, and I'm going I'm to pause our prayer. For those of you who are in the room, just, just that God's going to hear our prayer here. We, we had uh, one of our brothers pass away this weekend that was one of our founding instrumentalists, and he played with these guys for years and years. Um, Ray Green passed away on Saturday. So I want us to pause and actually remember him uh, in this time and, and honor him. If you would mind, actually, let's stand. And we're going to have a moment of silence while we pray for Ray Green's family and, uh, uh, and, and that God would keep him in his care. Let's take a moment. God, we lift up Ray to you. Um, uh, for, for like a year now, he's been a, a hole in our music team. Uh, and, and all of us on the music team thought he'd, he'd be back. He'd be playing music at some point. Uh, but now he's with you. He's worshiping you fully in spirit and in truth. And so, God, we, we commend him to your care. We commend ourselves to your care as well, that you would would uh, uh, help us to, to um, find solace in you, find uh, care and comfort in you. So God, uh, do that also with Ray's family, his children, and his siblings, his mom. Um, we lift them all up to you in this time. As we go through the week and we uh, uh, celebrate his life in the service too, we ask that you be with us as we do that also. And so, Lord, for this time of worship, we do celebrate, but we do it with heavy hearts because one of our brothers is missing, so we lift him up to you at this time. Be with us as we hear from your word. Be with us as we worship you, also in our limited way, in spirit and in truth. We, we're going to join Ray in singing these songs to you. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Same old road, miles and miles. Been here the same old 
Father, we are so thankful that we can sing those words and know the truth behind them. Lord, that you are so close to us. Lord, that your desire is to draw closer and closer to us. I pray that if there's anyone here who desires that closeness and just cannot find it, Lord, that you would break through to them, that you would show them your love, your presence, and your peace today. And Lord, as we go into your word through this message, Lord, that we would continue to draw closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. So we're working on this series, um, it's called Unmasking Our Faith, and uh, uh, it's like a practical guide on how to be a Christian during a pandemic, um, when we gotta wear masks all the time, well how can we uncover the mask to show that we are Christians, that we believe in Jesus? And so uh, worship's been out of the picture for the most part for quite a while since March, like public and personal worship. Uh, there's a few of us gathered here uh, in live in person, but uh, most people are just still doing it online. So that's one of the big ways that we show that we're Christians, uh, but we can't do that very well anymore. So how can we also show we're believers in Jesus in other ways? And one thing we talked about was loving people within the church. Jesus said, you'll know you are my disciples by how you love one another, loving within the church. So uh, we spent a week talking about that. And then another way is being bold by sharing our faith with people who have not yet heard Jesus. We talked about moving people one step closer to Jesus Christ, whether they're already a follower or not. Uh, we can help them get closer to Jesus Christ. And then last week we talked about follow. The word was follow, following Jesus by taking up our cross. Um, none of that, none of those things has to do with worship in particular. Like none of those things are, are things that make us gather on a Sunday morning to sing songs and hear a sermon. Those, those are things that we do as believers to reveal, to unmask our faith and show that we're people of faith. Well, uh, one of the things about being in a, a pandemic is we do wear masks. Some people are wearing some in here. I was wearing one earlier. And there's been some crazy masks out there. You've seen some goofy masks. Uh, uh, and so I've asked you to send in your crazy mask pictures, your wacky mask. It's been a wacky mask challenge. So I keep getting more and more in. If you look at my front pocket, I got a River Road gift card in one of those spots there, if you could pull that out. Um, I, and the best ones that I get each week, uh, the person who sent it to me gets to have a River Road gift card. So. Keep sending those in. I think we got maybe two or three more weeks on this, so, so send those in. Uh, to email them to me or, or hashtag it so I see it, uh, tag me or whatever. Here's a few that I got over the last week or so. Um, there's this one. Uh, that's from a movie. I got this one from several people, actually. The first time I got it, I was like, eh, I don't know about showing that in worship. But then when I got it from a bunch of people, I was like, okay, it must be a thing. Do you remember the movie? Alien, yeah, <laughs> alien, I never saw it. We were too Christian for that. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, so, so that was a good one, uh, I don't know. There's this one too, if you can see what that disgusting thing is on his face, uh, somebody's underwear. <laughs> okay, and this one, this one you can't see very well. I've seen this one around the internet before, it says coffee filter, like C-O-U-G-H-Y, coffee filter, it's just filter, and it is a coffee filter. And then Frankie sent this one in, a, it's a pizza mask, I really like this one, because uh, uh, their family uh, runs Massey's Pizza. Uh, Rich, who was playing guitar for us, that's his wife, Frankie, and it was leading contender. I was ready to give her this one until I received this one, which happened just last week. Our brother Alan back there, I had to give the nod to this one, it's hashtag America. And you got the engaging work sign in the back. So, River Road gift card to you, Alan. Well done, well done. Oh, and he's got it. He's got it with them on the cajon back there. So send those wacky masks in. Uh, uh, Five dollar gift card next couple weeks. So 
Uh, that is, it's been fun, fun to see those, get them in. Um, I've saved some back yet to see, because I get quite a few, but then I don't know if the next week I'm going to get enough. So I've got a f- couple that you all sent. You're like, wait, you haven't shown mine yet. Well, just wait, it'll get shown. And then if we have a ton at the end, I'll just load you all up with them then. So um, we live in a, a polarized world. Would you say that, that we live in a polarized world? Okay, I think we can agree on that. Um, Jesus also lived in a polarized world. I want to talk about Jesus' world that he lived in for just a minute. It was a completely segregated society based on this one word, purity. It was a purity culture. And everything that happened in that culture was based off of whether you were clean or unclean. It even went to this, whether you were rich or poor, healthy or unhealthy, Jew or Gentile, but all of them neatly fit under one of those categories. There's no room for in between. It was completely polarized. You either is or you ain't. Okay, you you either is is clean or you ain't clean. One or the other. And there is no in between. Now, being rich didn't necessarily make you clean, but being poor necessarily made you unclean. There was no middle class to where you could be like clergy. You know what clergy is? That's like when, when you wear your shirt like a half a day and you're like, it's not quite dirty, but it's not clean anymore. It's, it's clergy. It goes in the clergy pile. It's not ready for the dirty laundry pile. That's middle class for you right there. But being healthy made you clean, and being unhealthy made you, what? Unclean. Being a Jew made you clean so long as you followed all the rules and were a a good, proper Jew. But being a Gentile, a non-Jew, made you unclean. It didn't matter what you did. You were unclean. And really, wouldn't that be an easier way to look at life? It's just like, ah, let's just go back to that. It'd be a lot easier. You know, then we wouldn't have to think about anything anymore. We wouldn't have to worry about uh, what people are really like. We could just throw them in two categories. They're either clean or unclean, and then we don't have to even think about it anymore. They didn't have any nuance to people. They didn't have any, any uh, 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 what give or take on people. You either hated the person or you accepted the person, and there wasn't much in between. And it was easier just to throw the baby out with the bathwater. It didn't matter what the person was actually like. They're unclean. They're done. Forget about it. You're either all good or you're no good. When they could easily dehumanize other people, then they didn't have to give them any thought. They didn't have to give them any love. They didn't even have to give them any consideration. Those were the dominating social constructs of Jesus' day. Right? Can... If you've heard the Bible stories long enough, you've probably heard most of those things, maybe not all compiled in one spot like that. So Jesus comes into this social construct of his day, and he wants to come in, and he turns it upside down. Jesus didn't want to follow that same construct of life where it's just clean and unclean based on what you do. He wanted to get to the heart behind the matter. Now, the story we're going to look at is one of the follow me stories. Um, um, last week I said in the message on, on following that Jesus used that phrase, follow me, like around 23 times. So this is one of those times that Jesus said, follow me. Very early on in Jesus' ministry, while he's still gathering his disciples, he's going out to fishermen, he's going out and finding all these, this ragtag group of people to uh, uh, follow him, right? So he's getting all these people like Peter, James, Andrew, John, like, hey, you're, I know you're fishing right now, but follow me. And what do they do? They drop their nets and they just go and follow him. And he starts putting together this motley crew of guys that eventually become the 12 apostles and they follow him around for three years. And these guys were unusual to select because most of, most of them were actually, would, would be considered on the unclean side. 
Now, Jesus was, was modeling this, this idea of a rabbi, and a rabbi would be a prominent teacher in the culture that would go around and just teach these disciples who would come along with them. But every other rabbi basically had a, uh, an application process where, where cream of the crop, young men, had always had to be men, would apply to go with the prominent rabbi and follow him around and learn from him all of the things that the guy had to teach him. Well, Jesus wasn't taking applications. He was just going to people who were unclean and saying, what? Follow me. Follow me. So it was unusual for him to do it this way. So we get to this guy, Levi. He's also called Matthew. He's the one who put together the book of Matthew. Uh, But in, in the book of Mark, where we are today, He's going by the name Levi. Levi is a tax collector. Now, if you've been at Engage Newark for very long, we've talked about tax collectors before. Tax collectors and Samaritans are some of the worst people. Tax, this guy's a tax collector. And these tax collectors are, are, are awful people in this society of clean and unclean, in this purity culture, because they're turncoats. These these uh, turncoats would, would collect taxes to collect money for the Roman occupiers, right? All right, so some little history here. And the Roman occupiers had tons of taxes, and they would get these willing local citizens to go out and collect the taxes for them and send the money up. Tons of taxes. You think you got a lot of taxes. Here's the taxes that they had to pay. This is just the, 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 um, the um, like government, the civic taxes, I guess that would be the word for it. Income tax, road tax, animal tax, animal tax to use the road, slave tax, sales tax, conscripted military tax, inheritance taxes, property taxes, annual taxes for just being alive. Like you, you're, you're existing. We're graciously allowing you to exist. So now you owe us 17 shekels or whatever. So then there's uh, produce tax, resource use fees, then just a general local tax burden that the governing class would implement upon the people. All right, that's just the civic taxes, to say nothing of the religious taxes, because the Jews had their own religious taxes as well to keep the temple open and employ the, 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 um, the Levites. So this guy, Matthew, Levi, was a tool of the Roman government to go collect all of these taxes. Here's the thing, they did it by jurisdiction. So there was a geographical area that Levi would have had to cover to get all of those taxes collected from the people. And and then he would kick it up to the next level. There was like an overseer guy that they would have, so there's all these guys on the lower level. They would kick it up to another guy. Now Zacchaeus was probably one of those guys. Remember Zacchaeus, the wee little man? Wee little man was he, climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. So he was a tax collector also, but he was like an upper level Levi was a lower level, sending the money up to a guy like Zacchaeus. Now, um, uh, those guys got wealthy because Matthew here, uh, uh, collecting the, the, the taxes from the people around them, what they usually did was actually pay all of the tax burden for their jurisdiction to the Zacchaeus guy, right? The, the next level guy. He'd, he'd pay it all himself. And then he would go out and collect it to reimburse himself. So, so then, like, he's tempted, not just tempted, but he would actually go and charge more, right, to make it worth his while, right, and to make up for people he probably couldn't get a hold of, right? So I might as well charge Alan more since Sean ain't paying, whatever. So these guys were seen not only as turncoats, but as thieves, they were taking more than their fair share. So after paying all that money, he needed to recoup the expenses and then charge extra. This is another reason why tax collectors were hated. This made them unclean. Okay? They were on the unclean side. They were not on the clean side. So I was thinking about of all the jobs that, that there are in the world today, do we still see that about some professions? Are there, are there jobs today that we would look at as unclean? These people are this profession, therefore they must be this type of person. Maybe, maybe IRS agents, tax collectors. 
<laughs> Tax collectors, even today. Lawyers. Lawyers are... Sorry, lawyers. Sorry. I have friends who are lawyers, too. Uh, prostitutes. We look at prostitutes. We don't always look at the guy who's visiting the prostitute, but the prostitute. These days, health department officials. I'm sure ours in Lincoln County are great. We love them. But Dr. Amy Acton, she was, you, I don't need to say anymore. You know. Governors not having a good day these days with having a clean job. Um, I was thinking about day traders, too. You know, people were just trying to make money off of the back of somebody else. Insurance salespeople, maybe, you know, or any kind of sales. We kind of look down on like used car salesmen. They're always, I've heard that medical supply sales are rough people, too. Heard that from a knowing source. Um, professional sports teams, owners or players. Sometimes those people are, are looked down on, you know, like, ah, this is scum of society. Get this, and, and like, I never thought that I'd see the day that police officers are seen these days as having a, which is terrible, terrible. So we still do this. You probably have ideas in your head. You could shout one out. Dirty, dirty job. Dirty job. What is it? Politicians. Oh, I gotta forget that. Career politicians. Yeah, yeah. So, so we have these professions that we view as sort of unclean until we get to know the person who's actually doing the job. And we're like, actually, probably Dr. Acton is a very lovely person. She's probably great. I've read things. She's nice. She just looked evil while she was trying to protect us. Anyway, that felt like a lead balloon. <laughs> what happens is we throw the baby without, out with the bathwater. And we do to people now like we did to people in Jesus' day. We don't consider more behind the person than what is happening. So Jesus was about to turn this upside down. That was the point of Jesus' ministry, to turn these things upside down and give us new life. Mark chapter 2, 13 through 17. Mark 2, 13 through 17. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up, and he followed him. Now, Luke's gospel tells this story as well, and he says, uh, he emphasizes in here that um, uh, Luke, or I mean Levi, left everything. Similar to the other disciples when they left their nets. They just dropped everything and followed. Uh, Luke says Levi left everything, meaning this financial wealth that he had as a tax, tax collector. So I have this vision of, of Levi. He's sitting in his tax collector's booth, and he's getting railed on by the people who walk by. You know, ah, oh, man, you scum. You have this dirty job. You're terrible. I hate you, you know. And, and Levi's over there. He's like, dude, I'm just trying to do my job. You know, I just, I just, I'm here with you. I'm just trying to do my job. Please pay your taxes. Maybe he's at work watching the clock, you know, and he's playing the game. You've ever played that game? When you hate your job, you play the game that, uh, what would I be doing if I weren't here right now? You know, like, man, if I weren't here collecting taxes, for sure I'd be star on the stage and people would love me, definitely. Man, if I weren't here collecting taxes, I'd be a chef and I'd have my own restaurant and, I, and people would love me. I, I feel like all of Levi's would be like, people love me, you know, because nobody loves this guy. They all hate him. Maybe if I weren't here collecting taxes, I'd be the best gladiator in the whole world. Because <laughs> that was gladiator culture, you know? They lifted those guys up. I don't know what Levi's dream was, except probably he didn't necessarily like being in the tax collector's booth. I, I, I used to work um, uh, excavating. Uh, back in college, I had an ex a job at an excavating company. It was called High Tech Excavating, and we joked that there was nothing tech about high tech. Um, but there was this guy, Bobby, uh, uh, he always sat in his truck before work started. I think it was every Tuesday or Wednesday, he was long time in his truck, 
the rest of us guys would gather and we just sit, stand there and chat. And Bobby never came. And we're like, Bobby, what are you doing in there? He's like, I'm just waiting to see what or hear what the numbers are for the, um, the lotto. Because if I hit, I'm not getting out of the truck. I'm just going to drive off, and you probably aren't going to see me again, depending on how much I win. He would look for any reason not to go into work that day, and he was out of there. But he never, I don't know if he ever won. He didn't win while I was working with him. Maybe you play this other game at work. If you don't like your job, you ever look at the clock and then say, I'm not going to look at the clock again for two more hours. I'm not even going to look at the clock. I did this, I worked at a, in a produce department at, at Big Bear in Mount Vernon. And uh, I was like, okay, I'm not looking at this watch again. I'm going to wait two hours. Two hours goes by, I look, 15 minutes? <laughs> That's all? That, come on now. It's because you, want, you don't want to do your job. And, and when you don't want to do your job, you look for any reason or the first reason to quit doing it. And you get out of there. And I think that Levi, he's sitting in his tax collector's booth, and I don't think he really wants to be there, and Jesus, the first person to come along and talk to him with compassion, the first person to maybe even accept him, the first person to invite him into a relationship, Jesus comes and says, follow me. And Levi drops everything. I'm out of here. I'm with that guy. Levi did follow Jesus. Verse 15, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. I Meaning there's a lot of people around with Jesus. There was more than just the 12 the entire time. There was a whole passel of people that were following him. I think we know a lot from this verse. You know, Levi was doing okay financially. We know it because he had a big dinner at his house. He invited people in, so he was doing okay. Uh, two, Levi had friends in low places. Remember that song, that Garth Brooks song? That's my go-to karaoke song, by the way. <laughs> so no, I don't, so probably the only one I know all the way through. Tax collectors, which I've already told you about, tax collectors, and sinners were there. Tax collectors and sinners. Most of us would put ourselves in that category anyway. He didn't have any friends that were on the clean side of life. He only had unclean friends. Now, I would say that most of these unclean friends were probably his co-workers. Notice, he doesn't say that Levi invited all of his neighbors there. He invited his co-workers and the other sinners that could hang out with him. The neighbors aren't there. He brought the co-workers to his goodbye party. I think that's what it was. It was his last day of work. I'm done. I'm out of here. Let's blow this popsicle stand and have a good time doing it before I'm out of here for a long time. I want to say this. Like, How many of us, just think about it, how many of us would have a party at our house and before we would invite our neighbors, we would invite our co-workers? I, I, I venture to say most of us would. We, we have a better relationship with the people we spend 40 plus hours a week with than we do the people we live next door to. I, I'm ashamed to think, as I said that, you know, and I wrote this and thought it like, oh man, probably would be me too. I may not, I, I, we've invited our neighbors to do things. I'm not saying we never did that, but I'm having you all people over before. <laughs> Just the way we do. So we, well, right, the Duffs, yeah. At your house, you don't want the Duffs over. Like, yeah. Yeah, everybody else is okay. Right. So, so Levi here, he doesn't invite his neighbors. They're probably a little bit clean. He invites all of his coworkers and the sinners. Now, just a, a, a little aside here. Jesus brings this group with him. Um, they're these followers that are starting to follow him around. and They go to this tax collector's house. They have a meal with other tax collectors and sinners. Now, some commentators said that these sinners were actually probably prostitutes. So you got these men tax collectors that have money 
And then you have these women prostitutes who need money. And so these two unclean occupations work well together as a, a cohabitant relationship, if you know what I'm saying. It's a pretty motley crew that Jesus is hanging out with here. Um, these people can't hang out with anybody else because they're unclean. So they only have each other. Jesus moves into this place with the prostitutes and tax collectors. Jesus, the Holy One, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the Messiah, has followed Levi to this house for a meal to hang out with the dregs of society. Verse 16, when the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? I kind of think the, the Pharisees were just jealous that they weren't invited to the party. <laughs> you, know, you think about that? Like, like, that, like the, the classic, like the rich kid's um, parents are out of town for the weekend, so he throws a secret party, but one kid doesn't get invited and his nose is snubbed, so he blows the whole thing up by calling the cops or whatever and, and, tell, and ratting them out. Like, that's the Pharisees right here. Oh, man, what is he do? Now, I don't, I, actually, I think they were more abhorred at Jesus having this, starting to develop this character where he's saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, follow me, they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. You, can't, you can't say that and be around these people like that. They thought that was nuts. You can't be eating with tax collectors and sinners. Then Jesus gives this pithy quote that everybody loves. I love this thing. He's really thinking on his feet here. On hearing this, this is verse 17, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous. I've come to call the sinners. That's why I'm here. He turns it completely upside down. No more of this clean, unclean. We're trying to bring the, the cleanness to the unclean. We're trying to transform their lives. And Jesus is saying, you're not sick. You already know the way to salvation. I'm coming to the people who are sick. The people actually need me. Now, I've toyed with this sermon a couple of times. I, I, I wrote it a couple of times because I thought first, like, maybe we need to put ourselves in the shoes of Jesus where, like, the challenge is we're going to go to where nobody else goes and, and let's all be like Jesus and go there. Let's go to the places where they need us. And the, the first name of the sermon that I had, because I'm trying to do, like, one word, like, follow and be bold and, you know, like, so we can remember those things. This, the first one I had was undesirables. Let's go to the undesirables. But then I remember the 2016 election. Remember that? I think it was Clinton was like the undesirables or something. I don't remember exactly, but I was like, there's political connotation with that, and it's not very nice. You know, it's not, it's not nice. But the idea would be, let's be like Jesus, where we're going to go to places where people are unwilling to go. But honestly, we challenge ourselves with that all the time. That's, that's how we live in this church. This is what we do. So, so I'm not going to camp out on that, but I have just mentioned it. And then I thought, let's drive home the point of, of Jesus' quote that, that the well don't need a doctor, only the sick need a doctor. They, we just need to go find the sick, obviously. A, we could play on that, the coronavirus thing going around. I could, I could maybe develop something creative around that. But then I saw something in the passage that I never really saw before. I think the challenge for us is to be the tax collector today. Because look what the tax collector did. Here's what Levi did. He's sitting in his booth with people being angry with him. And Jesus says, follow me. And he gets up immediately and he follows Jesus. We talked about that last week. Take up your cross, follow Jesus, all that. So he does it. He leaves everything. But what's the next thing that he did? The exact next thing that he did? Levi brought Jesus into his work relationships. I, I never really noticed that before. 
He brought Jesus to his work relationships. He, he throws a, a going away party for himself, and then he invites all of his work buddies and Jesus and Jesus' followers to come and be a part of that. I know it's a touchy subject for us to like, uh, I, can't, I can't bring Jesus into the workplace. I'm not, I'm, I don't know. I, so I know it's touchy, but that's probably why it's important to talk about. So let's, let's talk about it. I had a guy in my small group years ago um, who, who reported in that he was so excited that um, he realized a coworker of his was a Christian. He's like, I've worked with this guy for 10 years, and he's a Christian, and now we can talk about Jesus in the workplace. Like, it's so nice to have somebody with me to, to, to be uh, engaged with, you know, and talk about our faith. And, and he was celebrating that. And I was like, how did it take... 10 years for him to know that you're a Christian. You want to talk about putting a mask on your faith. How did it take 10 years for him to find that out? What is happening here? You go to church, go to small group, serve in the community, and spend 40 plus hours a week with that guy, and he doesn't know that you believe in Jesus? Mm. The first thing Levi did after meeting Jesus was introduce Jesus to his co-workers. And he was a tax collector. I venture to say, none of us have that unclean of a job. We're mostly respectable people. If Levi can do it, so can we. We're talking about unmasking our faith. Do people in your workplace know that you believe in Jesus at least? Or do you have a mask over your faith? And what about school? Students, we got a couple in here. What about school? I don't want to hear that crap about, oh, they took prayer out of school. That's garbage. They didn't. They just made it so you can't force somebody to pray. You can't force somebody to believe in Jesus, and there's nothing more Jesus than that, than not forcing people. And Jesus wants an open, free relationship. He wants it invitational. This is hard for students, but, but uh, uh, do other students know that you're a Christian in your school? Or do you have a mask over your faith? And please understand, I'm not talking about Bible thumping, Okay? I'm not talking about that. The Pharisees were the Bible thumpers in this story. Jesus didn't go to the dinner party with the tax collectors and sinners and pass out tracts with four spiritual laws on them. I got something for you to read. You're really going to need to see this. You know, that's not what he did. He didn't go to this dinner party with tax collectors and sinners and say, you guys are all tax collectors and sinners. Guess what? They already knew that. They, they already knew where they stood in their society. Please know that I'm not talking about starting a Bible study or anything like that here. Look what Levi did to introduce people to Jesus. What did he do? He threw a party. <laughs> he threw a party. That's awesome. Christians should throw the best parties, I think. It's a celebration. It's a time of enjoyment. It's not a time to tell the world everything that's going wrong with them. Rather, it's a time to be loved, to show love, to show enjoyment to the world. Now, we've used this, this lingo that I'm about to tell you before, um, mostly in, in view of the, the Little Arrows Play Cafe that we started. We have three domains of space. This is just kind of a societal thing. This is like everybody has this. Like the first space is your home. Like home is your, your, your first space. That's kind of where you're, you can be truly yourself. And then second place would be work or school. You know, everybody has an outlet where they're kind of being productive in society. And then third space is recreational. Now we built the Play Cafe around the third space idea that, that young families need a place where they can go to relax and just be 
Um, sometimes that's the, the athletic fields, you know, the ball diamond, football field, whatever it is that's, that's recreational for you. A lot of people will go to a bar, you know, and have that relational space and recreational space there. Well, during this time of pandemic, basically recreational space is gone. Like even, even the ball fields are deeply limited. We had a cross-country meet yesterday that was way different than anything we had been a part of. It was just different. So this third space, Little Airs Play Cafe, is completely transformed. It's different. Third space is not what it used to be. First space home is basically a fortress now because we are, are locking ourselves in and we don't invite too many people from outside unless we really, really know them or trust them. We thought it was a fortress before, but you ain't getting in now. No way, because you might be unclean. <laughs> you might have a disease. <laughs> you got the Rona. So what we have now is second space. That's kind of where, where we function as we get back into the workforce or school. Our kids are online, so even second space isn't quite what it was. Um, work is that second space where we can be Jesus, where we can throw a party about Jesus, where we can invite others into a relationship with Jesus. So I'll ask you this, who's in your second space? Levi only had tax collectors and sinners. That's all he had. We've got sinners. We've got whatever other work that we do. What would it look like if we unmasked our faith in our second space? What does that mean to you individually? Each week I've had a bit of a challenge for us to try to do something to unmask our faith and, uh, with each of the steps that we've had. And I've tried to do them too, to be honest with you. I've, I'm, I'm trying to unmask my faith as well. This week's going to be super easy for me because all my co-workers love Jesus already. Looking at you guys. I don't know where Carrie went. Um, but I can still point them to Jesus. Oh, there she is. Yeah, yeah. Take the mask off of your faith to reveal Jesus' love for everyone, everyone, including your coworkers. Don't forget them. They're the people you would invite to a party anyway. They're the people that probably know you better than your neighbors. They're the people you probably trust better than your neighbors, more than your neighbors. Take the mask off of your faith and reveal love in your second space. Let us pray. God, um, these words in Mark are a challenge for us because it's a pretty vulnerable spot for us to be in with our coworkers. Um, so give us courage. Um, give, us, give us direction. Give us an opening that would be natural for us to be able to share Jesus with you and, and, and not do it in a way that, that thumps them in the head, but rather it feels more like a party. It feels more like something that's enjoyable, something that's, that's loving and lovable. So God, um, uh, give us that uh, uh, necessary grace to be able to do those things. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Sacrifice your life so 
Turn. He has redeemed us. He's taken our status as tax collectors and sinners and turned them into something clean. Now we get to love him in return. Let's celebrate it. Let, let's throw a party about it. Let's invite our co-workers to it so he can redeem them as well. God bless you this morning. We'll see you next week. Next week, I think we really are in the ballroom uh, next Sunday. So uh, uh, we'll be back over there. Uh, we are working now towards thinking about children's ministry again. Don't forget the Wacky Mass Challenge. Unite tonight for middle school kids and up 630 at More Life Church. God bless you all. We'll see you next Sunday.